Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Tech Tuesday. And I've been covering a topic on cholesterol just recently because it seems like a lot of people are suffering from this problem. And it tends to cause all sorts of grief with all sorts of things. And as I said from the beginning, and I had a couple of people that I've spoken to just recently about this as well, cholesterol isn't the enemy. Cholesterol is only a problem when it sits still in the arteries and the veins and it oxidizes and it causes a blockage. That's when it becomes a problem. Other than that, it's not the enemy. Your brain is mostly cholesterol. Your liver creates cholesterol on its own. So if you try and stop those things, hmm, you're going to have problems. So we need to learn to prevent the excess cholesterol. Remember, there are two different types. There's HDL, which is the helpful cholesterol, or the good one, and LDL, which is the so-called nasty one. Uh, I think it's um, Prof. Tim Noakes says there's no such thing as good or bad cholesterol. There's cholesterol. <laughs> So he's a professor, we won't argue with him. But yeah, that's the bottom line. So let me carry on from pretty much where I left off last week. And I have a few of these goodies over here. Um, so we, we're covering this topic of cholesterol and trying to figure out if it's the enemy or not. And I think we're at the stage where we figured out that it's not really the enemy. Now, what medical problems can affect your cholesterol levels? Medical problems and cholesterol have a two-way relationship, like a lot of things. High cholesterol can cause medical problems like arteriosclerosis. And when we talk about high cholesterol, they're talking about high levels of the LDL, which is the so-called bad cholesterol, and arteriosclerosis is simply a hardening of the arteries. And as I said, when the cholesterol sits still and it oxidizes, that's when it blocks up. Again, think of your drain, fat and oil going down there. It's not a problem as long as it's liquid. When it congeals, it blocks up, it's a problem. As long as it's free flowing, Pour some boiling water and a little bit of LDC down there and you'll have free-flowing drains again. We can't exactly do the same thing with our arteries. Some medical conditions can also put you at a higher risk of having high cholesterol, though. And some of these things are things like chronic kidney disease or CKD. People with CKD face a higher risk of developing coronary artery disease. And this, unfortunately, comes about a lot from... Um, people with diabetes, HIV. People with HIV are nearly twice as likely as people without HIV to have a heart attack or stroke. And that's because the HIV affects your immune system. And please note, HIV and AIDS are actually two separate things. It's not the same thing. The other one is a thyroid disease. Having thyroid disease... <clears throat> Pardon me, can affect your cholesterol levels because the thyroid hormone influences how your body processes the lipids or the fats, and the impact depends on what kind of thyroid disease you have. There's quite a few. The other thing is a thing called lupus or lupus erythematosus. People with, lup with lupus usually have higher levels of bad cholesterol or your LDL and triglycerides. They also have lower levels of HDL, or good cholesterol. And people who have active lupus face a greater risk of high cholesterol compared to those who have well-managed or quiet lupus. And lupus is an autoimmune disease um, that can cause all sorts of nasty issues. And it's autoimmune is similar to things like your um, rheumatoid arthritis, Lupus is another one, there's, and there's a few of them that are called autoimmune diseases where your body essentially turns on itself. And lupus is often linked with a few other 
issues at the same time. It's possibly a, a subject that I need to cover at, at some stage because it's a completely different topic on its own. But lupus leads to massive inflammation in the body, which, as we know, inflammation is not a good thing. The other one is polycystic ovary syndrome, or PCOS, which apparently is quite common. And people with um, PCOS face a higher risk of heart disease. And this risk goes up more as they age. Again, as far as I'm aware, an autoimmune disease, but definitely one that involves a lot of um, inflammation. Diabetes. Uh, you get both type 1 and type 2. They are talking about a type 3 these days, but for the purposes of this, we'll stick to type 1 and type 2. This doubles your risk for coronary artery disease and peripheral artery disease. And diabetes is linked with low levels of HDLs and higher levels of triglycerides and LDLs. And I can tell you that diabetes is one of the leading causes for amputation as well. I see that a lot in our practice. Now, where does cholesterol and healthy eating come in? We all get told that if you've got cholesterol, you need to watch your diet. But what are we watching in that diet? What we eat has an impact on our cholesterol levels and can help reduce our risk of disease. The Heart Foundation recommends following a heart healthy eating pattern, which means eating a wide variety of fresh and unprocessed foods and limiting highly processed foods, including takeaway, baked goods, chocolate, chips, lollies, and sugary drinks. Generally, junk food and all the really nice stuff. Not only does this help to maintain a healthy and interesting diet, but it provides essential nutrients to the body. A heart-healthy eating pattern includes plenty of vegetables, fruit and whole grains, a variety of healthy protein-rich foods, especially fish and seafood, legumes such as beans and lentils, nuts and seeds. Smaller amounts of eggs and lean poultry can also be included in a heart-healthy eating pattern. And it used to be said that stay away from eggs because they cause cholesterol. They don't. If choosing red meat, make sure it is lean and limited to one to three times a week. Unflavored milk, in other words, fresh from the factory, yogurt and cheese also needs to be not cut out, but limited. And people with high cholesterol should choose reduced fat varieties, healthy fats and oils. Choose nuts, seeds, avocados, olives, and their oils for cooking herbs and spices to flavor food instead of adding salt. And if you Google, you can find quite a few different herbs and spices that you can use to replace salt, amongst other things. And I will say that when I cook, I generally don't add salt to any of my food when I'm cooking. Um, I also try and grill foods as much as possible. I seldom use oil, and if I do, it's usually olive oil. The only exception to that that I make is if I fry eggs, which also is very rare, possibly maybe once, maybe twice a month, if that. And I generally stick to one fried egg at a time if I do that. Um, I'd rather make up an omelet because I find that to be a whole lot better, more filling and healthier. And when I, when I make an omelet, I add spices and herbs and a little bit of salt, very little bit of pepper and water. So there's not much else in there that causes problems. But that's just me and my recipe. This way of eating is also naturally high in fiber, which is good news because a high intake of dietary fiber can also reduce levels of bad cholesterol in the blood. Because remember, fiber is nature's broom. So you can get the cholesterol away from the artery walls and floating nicely in the, um, in the arteries or sitting around in your system, 
but how do you get it out of your system? Obviously, if there's if you think of a kitchen counter with a whole pile of dust or flour or something on the counter, what do you do? You get a cloth or you get a broom, or you use both because each one does a separate job, and you wipe it clean. Now imagine if you left that dust and the, the flour and whatever on your counter, maybe sprinkled it with a little bit of water, and you leave it there for a week or two weeks. Then you try and brush it off with a cloth or a broom. It's probably not going to work that effectively, apart from the fact that it's now not smelling so hot. But that is how cholesterol uh, works in your system as well. When it oxidizes, it becomes solid and it sits. So you need to keep it fluid and you need to be able to brush it out. And obviously you can't push a bottle brush down your arteries. It doesn't work that effectively, but you can have fiber, which acts as nature's brush. And also be mindful of how much you are eating. One of the simplest ways, and they did this, it was a university experiment a few years ago. I can't remember the exact university that it was done in, but in order to check and see how the whole brain and gut and everything works together, they took a whole lot of students, students make very good guinea pigs, and they gave them pretty much the same type of food. So they had, they were dishing up exactly the same food. They just put one lot of, of people were given a big plate and the plate was full. And one lot was given a smaller plate and the plate was full. Both groups reported that they felt full after finishing the plates. Yet one was eating about twice as much as the other. So the simple fact that your plate looks full makes your brain think that I am full. So one of the simplest tips to reduce weight, reduce the size of your plate. You can still make it full, but if the plate size diameter is smaller, you're going to automatically eat less and tricks your brain into making you feel full means you're not going to be hungry afterwards. Portion sizes have increased over time, and many of us are eating more than we need, which can increase our cholesterol and risk of heart disease. And if you look at, if you Google all those figures, it's, it can be quite scary, actually. Ideally, a healthy plate would include servings of one quarter healthy proteins, one quarter whole grains, and one half colorful vegetables. Did your supper plate look like that tonight? I know mine didn't. Um, it still had the healthy proteins. I wouldn't say there was a lot of whole grains and it had some colorful vegetables, but it didn't have a lot of the whole grains. A serving size can vary depending on age, gender, and specific nutrition needs. Remember, some people need less some people need more so if you are an athlete who is actively practicing um, for a marathon or active in the gym or a professional athlete like a mountain biker or a um, tennis player or etc you're going to need more of certain nutrition or nutrients in your food than somebody who's sitting having a marathon on Netflix, you need less of those items. So what are the, some of the tips to help to lower the cholesterol? As well as sticking to a varied and healthy diet, these tips can help you to manage your cholesterol without medication. Now the Heart Foundation recommends that people follow a heart healthy eating pattern, which is built on eating mostly plant-based foods eating more plant-based foods like vegetables, legumes, fruits, whole grains, nuts, and seeds is good for heart health. My little aside on this one, and it's a personal recommendation, I haven't seen it anywhere else um, officially as such, but I would suggest when eating nuts that they are the raw nuts, not the roasted and salted nuts. 
you need to include legumes or pulses such as chickpeas, lentils, split peas, all of which are high in fiber as well. Beans such as haricot beans, kidney beans, baked beans, and bean mixes in at least two meals a week. And then you need to check your food labels and choose the lowest sodium or salt products. Remember, a lot of these things are hidden salts, hidden fats. Beans make a great alternative to meat in tacos or snack on hummus with vegetable sticks. You can also add legumes to soups, pasta sauces, curries, and stews. And we often eat um, chickpeas and lentils and things like that in stew. And for me, a stew in a, in a slow cooker makes a really, really good meal, specifically if it's something like venison. You can use tofu or lentils instead of meat in stir fries or curries. Choose whole grain breads, cereals, pasta, rice, and noodles. But when you're choosing the whole grain breads, please read the label because some of these whole grain breads are not all whole grain. The main ingredient is white bread flour that's been dyed brown. So just be careful. It's not always what's there. The label might say something like heart healthy or whole grain. Read the label, read the fine print and see what it says. You need to snack on plain unsalted nuts and fresh fruit, ideally two servings of this every day. Use ever nut butters, tahini, or spreads made from healthy, unsaturated fats. If you're having peanut butter, for instance, try and get um, a natural peanut butter that doesn't have added salt or added sugar. Uh, there is a particular brand that uses, I think it's a yellow lid to designate that, and it says no added salt, no added sugar. And to be quite honest, I can't tell the difference between the one that does have the extra salt and sugar and the one that doesn't. Um, the unsaturated fats are things like canola, sunflower, or extra virgin olive oil. Instead of those made with saturated fats, such as butter, coconut oil, and cream. Again, be aware, canola oil, sunflower oil aren't always the healthiest things, but that's my opinion. And this is the Heart Foundation saying this, so we'll go with their recommendation for this talk. Use healthy oils for cooking. Some of these include canola, sunflower, and soybean. Olive or extra virgin is also a good choice and probably a preferable choice, as is sesame and peanut oils. For people at high risk of heart disease, the Heart Foundation recommends people eat two to three grams of plant sterile enriched foods every day. For example, plant sterile enriched margarine, yogurt, milk, and cereals. Again, personal recommendation would be rather you stick to the butter, not the margarine. But I'm not going to go against the Heart Foundation. That's just personal. You need to enjoy fish two to three times a week. And this is 150 grams of fresh or 100 grams of tinned fish. I'm not too sure about you, Anna. I live at the coast. I don't get that amount of fresh fish a week. I don't think I even get that a month. Ours is often frozen fish, which I'm really not too sure how good that is. Tinned fish will normally be things like tuna or sardines, but that's not a weekly thing. It's possibly once, maybe twice a month more than two to three times a week. Most people don't need to limit the number of eggs they eat each week. However, a maximum of seven eggs each week is recommended for people with high cholesterol, type two diabetes, and heart disease. Select lean meat or meat that is trimmed of fat and poultry without skin, and limit the unprocessed red meat to less than 350 grams per week. And again, personal opinion, if you're eating meat, look for free range or venison. Um, same with the poultry. Try and go for free range whenever possible. It's usually the safer option. Choose unflavored milk, yogurt, and cheese. People with high cholesterol or heart disease should opt for reduced fat options. 
Check the labels to make sure there's no added or hidden sugars. Non-dairy milks and yogurts are okay too. Opt for versions that have no added sugar and have had calcium added. Limit or avoid processed meats, including sausages and deli meats, such as ham, bacon, and salami. Not you, but for me, nothing beats a good bacon and egg breakfast, but that does not happen very often in our house. It's almost like a treat on a public holiday or maybe on a, on a weekend if I'm not out running. But usually a public holiday or even later on in the day, like a, like a brunch or a, a lunch, that kind of thing. But it's certainly not happening every day or even every week. Dietary fiber is a big thing. If you're trying to lower your cholesterol, aim to eat foods that are high in dietary fiber, particularly soluble fiber, because they can reduce the amount of LDL cholesterol in your blood. Remember, you get different types of fiber, mostly soluble and insoluble. Soluble meaning that it is absorbable. Insoluble, by definition, means that it's going to go in and go out. But when it goes out, that's the broom part. That's cleaning your gut. That's getting rid of all the junk and all the, all the, the waste products is the um, insoluble fiber that's sweeping it out. You also get things like lignans and pectins, etc., and they all have a specific role to play. You can increase your fiber intake by eating things like fruit, vegetables, legumes such as chickpeas, lentils, soybeans, and bean mixes, whole grains such as oats and barley, nuts and seeds. Again, I would say raw, unroasted, unsalted your dietary fats that you need to look at. Following a healthy, balanced diet that is low in saturated fats and trans fats can help to, re to lower your cholesterol. Aim to replace foods that contain unhealthy, saturated and trans fats with foods that contain healthy fats. And these would be things like your junk foods, your chips and that kind of thing. Foods high in unhealthy saturated fats include Processed or deli style meats such as ham, bacon, and salami. I know salami is very high in fat. Deep fried fast foods, your fried chickens, your fried chips, those kind of things, otherwise known as fries in some part of the world. Um, processed foods such as biscuits and pastries. Takeaway foods such as hamburgers and pizzas, your fast food, your junk foods. Fat on meat and skin on chicken. I know my family always looks at me squiff when I uh, uh, do a uh, particular chicken in a, in a pan with a little bit of olive oil and make the skin nice and crispy, but I peel that off before I eat it. I don't eat the, the skin at all. I leave it off and my family just look at me like I'm nuts. But that's me. I've always been like that. Same with fat on meat, things like your lamb fat and your um, pork fat and that sort of thing. I cut that off after cooking. Your good fats are also ghee and lard. Coconut oil, palm oil, often called vegetable oil in products, cream and ice cream, butter. Foods high in unhealthy trans fats include deep fried foods, baked goods such as pies, pastries, cakes and biscuits, takeaway foods, butter again, foods that list hydrogenated oils or partially hydrogenated vegetable oils on the ingredient list. Now the healthy fats are things that, that are like foods that are high in healthy polyunsaturated fats that include things like soybean, sunflower, safflower, canola oil and margarine spreads made from these oils. But be careful how they are processed because the processing is where the, the problems come about. Healthy fats include things like pine nuts, walnuts, Brazil nuts. Again, I'm going to say raw, unsalted. Fish, and I would suggest rather grill it as opposed to frying it. Tahini, which is a sesame seed spread. Linseed or flaxseed and chia seeds. Foods high in healthy monounsaturated fats include things like 
cooking oil made from plants or seeds, including olive, canola, peanut, sunflower, soybean, sesame, and safflower. Avos, olives, unsalted nuts such as almonds, cashews, and peanuts. And I'm running out of time, so we'll hop through this one fairly quickly. So some lifestyle changes also need to get taken into account. Number one, eat heart healthy foods. Reduce your saturated fats, eliminate trans fats, eat foods rich in omega-3 fatty acids, increase your soluble fiber, and add whey protein. Exercise on most days of the week and increase your physical activity. And I'm going to say exercise on any day of the week that ends in day. Figure that one out. But you can have the odd break here and, here and there. Quit smoking. If you're on fire, you can smoke. If you're not on fire, quit it. Lose weight. Much easier said than done, unfortunately. Drink alcohol only in moderation. And quite simply, if you don't drink, don't start. If lifestyle changes aren't enough, sometimes healthy lifestyle changes aren't enough to lower the cholesterol levels sufficiently. If your doctor recommends medication to help lower your cholesterol, take it as prescribed while continuing your lifestyle changes. Lifestyle changes can help you keep your medication dose low. And then as you've lost the weight, as you start to feel better, please go back to your doctor every three months or so. Let them check your cholesterol levels again so that they can reduce your medication. Because in my opinion, chronic medication shouldn't be. Yes, medication has its uses, but for the rest of your life, Mm, there are possible ways that you could reduce and in some cases re remove it altogether but do it please in conjunction with your doctor or your dietitian so that they can monitor you and do it in the correct manner in the healthy manner you never ever just stop medication especially if you've been on it for a while so some of the natural alternatives to medication Statin medications are the most used treatments for reduction of cholesterol levels and the risk of heart disease. Statin medications also block an enzyme known as HMG-CoA reductase, which is the weak point in cholesterol synthesis in the human body. Pharmaceutical firms have created a multi-billion dollar business with products which block this important enzyme. Statin medications block more than cholesterol formation. Coenzyme Q10 or CoQ10 is produced on the same metabolic pathway. Loss of this enzyme can lead to damage to the mitochondria where energy is produced in the body. Proper muscle functioning is dependent upon adequate levels of CoQ10. Many people develop severe muscle pain while using statin medications for this reason. So if you're on statins and you are suffering from sore muscles and sore joints, maybe you need to look at getting a, a CoQ10 supplement and or reduce the statins. Don't just stop them, but slowly reduce them under care with your doctor. Carried to, to, to its extreme, blockage of CoQ10 can lead to rhabdomyolysis, which is basically loss, <clears throat> sorry, loss of muscle and muscle tone. And this is a nasty condition in which damaged muscle tissue breaks down and just fades away and wastes away. The breakdown products are released into the bloodstream and can lead to kidney failure and death. The ability of statin drugs to block cholesterol synthesis in the brain and the importance of the substance for synapse form formation explains why transient memory loss and cognitive impairment have been associated with the use of statin medications. So if you say, oh, I can't remember a lot of the time, and you're taking statins, this is why. Failure of proper functioning of the mitochondria can result in memory impairment, neuropathy, and muscle weakness. So you're killing yourself slowly. 
damaged mitochondria speed the aging process, leading to physical deterioration in young people, which would not normally be seen until they were much older. So you're aging sooner than what you should do. Vitamin C, if oxidized fats are a serious risk for heart disease, and they are, it makes sense that antioxidant intake can provide significant benefit for those at risk of developing the disease. And one study found that an additional 300 milligrams of vitamin C a day reduced the rate of heart disease in men by half and in women by one third. That's quite significant. Studies have also shown that intake of other antioxidants such as vitamin E and flavonoids can also reduce the risk of heart disease. And the Schutt brothers advocated the treatment of heart disease with vitamin E in 1946 already, and their claims were rejected by the medical community then, but have since been validated. The Schutt brothers did their initial work with natural vitamin E and found it much more effective than the synthetic product, which was later introduced and used in scientific studies of vitamin E. Big surprise. Heart associations recommend that all adults eat at least two servings of fish, preferably fatty fish, a week. And this is because fatty fish such as salmon, mackerel, albacore tuna, and trout are low in saturated fats, while high in protein and the omega-3s, EPA, and DHA. Large-scale population studies provide evidence that people at risk of coronary heart disease benefit from consumption of omega-3s, an intake of EPA and DHA ranging from 0.5 to 1.8 grams a day significantly reduced the number of deaths from heart diseases and all other causes. The, the American Heart Association recommends that people with coronary heart disease consume one gram of EPA and DHA daily. Omega-3s have anti-inflammatory effects and can help to downregulate pro-inflammatory biomarkers they contribute to the buildup of arterial plaques, which help improve the vascular endothelium function. I'm going to stop there because I think we only have yeah, three minutes left. I will finish up that one next week. So in the three minutes, does anybody have any questions or comments before I stop the recording? <laughs> 